A very welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome back to Crash Course Economics. Uh, it's lovely to see you all here. This is the first webinar of our brand new and third Crash Course series. I'm very happy that you're all there. Uh, I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself in the chat. Maybe you can tell your name, where you're based, and what you're doing, or what brings you here to Crash Course. My name is Sarah. I'm the coordinator of the Alternative Trade Coalition at TNI, the Transnational Institute, and I'll be your host of today. And my co-host is Rodrigo Fernandez, who is a researcher at SOMO. Nice to see you, Rodrigo. And behind the scenes, we have our friends and colleagues, Jeremy Krollsmith, who is a web developer and designer website, Kees Hudig from globalinfo.nl, and Jenny Pannenbecker, who is a communications officer at SOMO, and they're working very hard to make this webinar a success again. So let me tell you a little bit about Crash Course in case you don't know it. So uh, the five of us were a collective of engaged activists and experts from a number of organizations, and you can find us uh, on our website. And we united at the start of the COVID crisis because we wanted to understand the crisis. So what's going on and reflect on ideas and solutions, how to get out of it. And Crash Course uh, arises as a platform uh, so we have a website and uh, we're hosting webinars and it's designed to open up the debate on how we can move out of the current crisis and make also the necessary steps towards achieving social, economic and ecological justice. And in order to do that, we're inviting global experts to break down uh, complex issues, mainly economic issues, and make them accessible to you all so that we can shape our economic system in a just and democratic way. And in that way, we hope to democratize knowledge and give you the necessary tools to change the world. So this time, this third series, we decided to discuss the challenges related to some of the big COVID winners, uh, like big tech. And there'll be at least five and perhaps even six webinars in this series every two weeks. And we're starting today. So in each webinar, we want to provide you with a one hour crash course on a specific subject that makes you understand our contemporary economy and society a little bit better. And you can watch all of our former webinars of the first two series online on our website. That's crashcourseeconomics.org. Uh, before I give the floor to Rodrigo, I'd like to congratulate uh, one of our uh, previous uh, Crash Course uh, webinar speakers, which is Jens van Klooster. Uh, Jens, um, we're very happy to say that you obtained your second doctoral degree today at the University of Groningen. Uh, I followed it. Uh, it was on the political economy of central bank risk management. Um, I really recommend all of you uh, to watch his webinar. It was very interesting. And it was also pleasant to see Daniela Gabor, another speaker of Crash Course of our first series there in your dissertation commission, committee. So once again, congratulations. Um, about this webinar, there will also be a recording of this webinar, as well as a podcast version and a summary, which will be published on our website. Um, Rodrigo, can I invite you to tell something about the first two series and introduce our third series? Yes, uh, thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> I would also like to congratulate uh, Jens, of course. Um, so this is the third series of Crash Course webinars. Um, we started when the pandemic was still uh, very fresh and central banks once again stepped in and acted as masters of the universe. Um, we explored uh, uh, the new role that banks play in contemporary capitalism. Uh, and we asked ourselves, what type of regime are we talking about when monetary policy and central banks are so central to the way our economic system operates? Um, so this is where Jens uh, von de Klooster and Daniela Gabor were invited, uh, and also uh, Benjamin Brown. Um, the second series was about uh, the unfolding debt crisis in, uh, in the global south. Um, there have been previous rounds of debt crisis in the past 40 years, uh, notably in the 1980s, when the structural adjustment programs emerged from the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, in our series, we explored what is different this time uh, and which structural conditions uh, remain the same. Um, in this third series, uh, as Sarah already mentioned, we will be looking at the winners of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, so one of a clear set of winners, of course, are big tech firms, uh, the digital monopolies uh, that have expanded their corporate power. Um, the COVID-19 uh, epidemic, uh, well, it acted as a catalyst for the big techification of everything. The world uh, was put on a tech diet uh, 
2020 accelerated many developments that had started to take shape before, but now have all well come to the surface. Uh, from being a helping hand, uh, a source of innovation, uh, or simply a power for good, uh, communication technology has increasingly become dominated by a small number of very powerful corporations. And these firms have amassed an unprecedented amount of financial firepower. Uh, this is affecting other sectors, banking, pharma, automobile. And for instance, it is also starving journalism from advertisement income and has made a business model from spreading disinformation uh, and, well, erecting mass surveillance of our societies. Uh, to understand this complex cluster of issues, um, so we've organized five different episodes and perhaps we will have a bonus episode, but well, we will note it a bit later on. Uh, we will move slowly in these episodes towards discussing solutions and how to fight back. But first, we need to have a better understanding of what we're dealing with. So the first two episodes uh, will be dedicated to take well, to, sh to provide a broader view. What are we talking about? Uh, and what are the concepts that we need to know? Uh, Sarah? Yeah, thanks, Rodrigo. So this also reminded me of uh, a report that you co-published on big tech and on the financialization uh, of big tech, or of, it was big pharma, wait, sorry. Uh, so let me uh, tell you something about uh, the webinar of today. Uh, the setup is as following. Uh, Rodrigo will shortly uh, introduce uh, today's speaker. Uh, who will have a presentation of more or less 15 minutes. And after that, Rodrigo and I have prepared some questions to guide you through uh, the matter. Um, and finally, there is uh, all the opportunity you have uh, to post questions. And you can do that uh, by the special Q&A tab, which you find in your Zoom screen. Um, if you pose a question there, uh, then we are able to read it out. Uh, and if you like a question, you can also endorse it by putting the thumbs up. Uh, so uh, if you think a question is really important and should be asked, please endorse it. If you have a question on your own, you can put it in the Q&A tab. Um, and we will finish at uh, yeah, uh, 17 hours here, which is just one hour of crash course. So I think it's time to uh, quickly dive into the matter. Uh, Rodrigo, may I uh, ask you to introduce our speaker today? Yes. Um, so today our first speaker is Keen Birch. Um, he's an associate professor at York University in Canada. As an uh, economic geographer, uh, he's focused on uh, neoliberalism uh, and published uh, well, some really interesting uh, research on neoliberalism. He's also uh, researched uh, the assetization or transforming things or activities into tradable financial assets. Uh, and also, he is increasingly been focusing on uh, techno-scientific capitalism. Uh, and this is why we invited him to speak uh, to us today. Uh, but of course, also to understand how these different strands of research, uh, well, all relate to each other. Uh, we are very happy to have him here. Um, and I would like to ask Keen to uh, put on uh, his camera and to uh, start with his talk. Keen, thank you for being with us. And welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so uh, I would like to start by uh, thanking everyone at Crash Course Economics, especially Rodrigo, Sarah, and Jeremy. Um, so the title of my lecture is uh, The Rise of Techno-Scientific Capitalism. Uh, and um, I, I'm going to give you an overview of kind of current political economy, contemporary capitalism, and uh, focus specifically on this rise of big tech. Uh, it's necessarily broad, but I think other people in the series will be covering more uh, specific topics. Uh, so I'll briefly outline what I'll discuss today. Um, I'll start with, you know, what is techno-scientific capitalism? You know, how do we uh, conceptualize what's going on? Uh, then talk about techno-economic paradigms to kind of contextualize this in a broader historical uh, framework. Uh, then talk about the rise of big tech, you know, what's been happening over the last decade or so, um, how to understand what's been going on with big tech, you know, what is big tech, and then finish by talking about this, this idea of, uh, you know, the relationship between, uh, between big tech and the broader kind of political economic um, context, uh, especially in relation to neoliberalism. 
So I'll start with this, this definition then. Oh, what is um, uh, big tech? No, what is, sorry, what is tech and scientific capitalism? Uh, and so some of you may not be um, sort of uh, used to this notion of techno science. It comes out of the field of science and technology studies, uh, where it's a, 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 a pretty um, common uh, concept. And it's used, used to kind of um, indicate the relationship between science and technology, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, co-productive, co-produced, co-created kind of relationship between science and technology. The idea that they um, that they are configured by the social, political, their social, political, economic context, basically. Um, so that's that's techno science. The the second uh, key kind of concept is obviously capitalism, uh, and I take I understand capitalism from this kind of um, a, a sort of institutional political economy perspective, drawing on economic sociology as well. Um, where the, the definition of capitalism contrasts to notions of this kind of naturalistic or efficiency you know, ideas that emerge in, in kind of more orthodox economics. So seeing capitalism as this system of, of um, obviously capital accumul accumulation based on private property, private contracting, wage, labor, that sort of thing, but also configured by uh, social institutions, some of which are formal, so money, for example, or, or regulation, but some are also informal. So there's the, uh, the um, important role of things like expectations, the sort of social expectations, narratives, stories, things like that, these kind of share me shared meanings and uh, shared understandings of the, of the world. Now, techno-scientific capitalism is my attempt to think through the, the way that techno-science and capitalism are increasingly tangled with each other. Uh, so techno-science, for example, is increasingly constituted by specific forms of financing. So we can think of corporate R&D, for example, as well as financial logic. So return on investment kind of calculations. Uh, at the same time, capitalism is increasingly constituted by techno-science. Uh, so we could think of here of things like, you know, the, the, the kind of pursuit of disruptive, so-called disruptive innovation, um, but also techno-scientific logics like network effects and so on. Um, so as a result, result of this entanglement, techno-scientific capitalism is defined by the, by the asset form. Uh, and I think uh, Cecilia Recap will talk about this in the, in the next uh, webinar, uh, specifically around intellectual property rights. So this is a kind of, you know, a specific kind of asset here. Uh, and it's also, scientific capitalism is also defined by this search for durable economic rents uh, and a rent being a, a form of uh, the control or ownership of an asset as a way to extract future revenues from it and then capitalize those future revenues in the present. Now, I think that tech, uh, big tech is a really good example of uh, illustration of, of techno-scientific capitalism. This is just an indication uh, you know, of, of um, some of the changes that have been happening um, over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, and it's really interesting to see this, this uh, huge expansion of so-called uh, big tech firms uh, in this time. So we can see here on the graph, uh, the difference between 2005 and 2020. Uh, and in 2005, we have a, a range of different kinds of firms that are the biggest firms by market capitalization in the world, uh, including kind of big oil firms, big pharma firms, big finance firms. And then on the right hand side, we see it's just dominated by big tech. Uh, so, you know, the, the one standout being the oil company, Saudi Aramco. Uh, so we have this domination today of, of the economy um, by big tech firms. And we've, we've been positioned this within a kind of wider historical framework. We can think about this uh, in terms of the uh, the, what, what uh, people like Carlotta Perez call uh, techno-economic paradigms, these kind of major revolutionary shifts in technologies and, uh, and financing that lead to huge changes in our economies. Uh, and I've just outlined a, a, a couple of these here and then added this, this third one on the right-hand side around digital data technologies. Um, and so the idea that uh, Carlotta Perez and others uh, argue is that uh, you have these these emerging techno-economic paradigms uh, that consist of firms, technologies, and financing that are often clustered around particular kinds of uh, industrial sectors and technologies, and they rise and decline over time. And so, you over over the you know the last 200, 300 years, you have the rise and decline of these these techno-economic paradigms as different technologies become more dominant uh, and then and then fall away as other. Uh, technologies to uh, take their place. So I now want to talk about uh, or think 
talk, uh, yeah, talk about the dynamics of the data and digital economy, so big tech in particular. And I'm going to thank my, my collaborators here that I've been working on this, uh, this area for the last few years. So uh, uh, Callum Ward and Troy uh, Cochran, we've been working together on, uh, on, uh, on research on this area. Uh, and this, this um, graph comes from some of that research, uh, and it shows uh, just the, the expansion of, of big tech uh, over the last uh, few decades. Um, and it's, uh, it shows the, this, this kind of uh, huge increase in the market capitalization of the, the five, the big tech five firms, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, uh, the, the huge rise in their market capitalization since around about 2010. Um, and especially, uh, you know, this, this has continued uh, uh, through the, the, the current uh, COVID pandemic as well. Uh, and I think we can see this, this kind of rise of big tech as the result of, um, uh, you know, it originates in, in um, three things, essentially, I think, that happened in the early 2000s. So the dot-com boom and bust. Uh, so this forced the, the kind of uh, search for new kinds of business models. There's also an interesting, I think, um, dynamic around the Microsoft monopoly case in the in uh, 2000 um, and the way that that uh, opened up space for companies like Google. And then there's the the post 2008 um, global financial crisis and the the um, the uh, the response to that crisis of flooding the capital markets with with money. And so you have this boom in these these tech not stocks that happen after, uh, as this graph shows, after around about 2010. So the, the investors are essentially looking for new kinds of investment opportunities, and uh, it seems that uh, big tech firms, tech firms generally, uh, become the, the the kind of favoured uh, place to to put their money. Uh, and so you have this this enormous valuations of these firms that do, just dwarf other firms. And so you can see the dark line at the bottom there. This, this, the, you know, the thick black line at the bottom is the the average of the other top 200 firms uh, in the in the U.S. And the you can see that the big tech five just you know they've just ramped up in uh, in, in significant contrast to these uh, these the this average. Um, and I think one of the impacts here, some of the impacts include this. This it's almost a sort of self fulfilling uh, you know, prophecy here. Where the expectations around big tech and the growth of big tech valuation, um, and around the the idea that they're going to become monopolies, means that uh, the, uh, the the cost of capital for these firms is cheaper. Investors are more willing to invest more more money in them, and then they they're able to buy out their competition or outcompete their competition, thereby fulfilling this kind of uh, this uh, original expectation, uh, and so transform themselves into these monopolies. Uh, it also has wider implications, which are, are, are important to, to note. Uh, so it in, has a wider impact on the, you know, the, the kind of uh, techno-economic landscape, as, as it were, in the sense that uh, new, new firms, new startups, you know, the, the kind of supposed uh, um, innovative uh, companies that emerge are often now, their, their strategic uh, approaches to, uh, uh, to be bought out by these these big tech companies, uh, and so investors, the venture capitalists, are deliberately focusing on buyouts as this kind of exit. Um, now, there's a note, need to make a note of caution here when we talk about big tech, and I'm afraid I hope this graph is is these graphs are are visible. Um, they are by, they are very diverse and heterogeneous. Um, and we can we broke down in the research I did with Troy Cocker and Colin Ward. We broke down the the asset base, the balance sheets of these five big tech companies to look at their you know what are the what are the main kind of uh, uh, underlying assets that that might be driving this this market capitalization these valuations. And we find that the, you know the five big tech companies have very different kinds of asset bases. Um, some. But well, it's it's significant that most of them have uh, you know a large kind of uh, sort of cash pile, as it were. They're sitting on a large on large cash piles. That's the black black kind of blodge at the bottom of the the graphs there. Uh, but there's also some other interesting findings 
Um, so for example, things like uh, at the top on the left, we have Apple. Apple stopped accounting for its intangibles in 2018. Uh, so that we, you know, it's something we, we didn't expect to see is the, the kind of disappearance of intangible assets from the, the balance sheets of a company like Apple. Um, now you could also see that Apple has, uh, has uh, used its cash if, if you see the, uh, the, the kind of dark gray uh, just above the black there, that's, that's the expansion of its investment on Brayburn Capital, so, which has led some people uh, to describe Apple as a, a, a hedge fund that makes phones. Uh, this is a, you know, close to well over $200 billion worth of, uh, of um, financial assets that they invest. Um, so they're, they're very different, basically. These, these graphs are supposed to show that they're very different. And it's also surprising we found that the uh, in contrast to the the other top 200 firms in the you know in the in, in the kind of U.S. stock market, that they generally these um, big tech firms had a lower proportion of intangibles uh, and a higher proportion of it, of tangibles in their in their balance on their balance sheets, uh, which we found surprising considering the 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 whole debate around the you know this kind of notion of the the rise of the intangible economy and the intangible assets and so on. So if they're all different, how do we then understand them together? Um, and I think here it's important to think about their size and their scale. Uh, so the previous slide showed the, you know, just their simple, you know, how big they are, uh, how, you know, their, their market valuation and so on. Um, and I think we can think of their size and scale as being critical here in two, on two fronts. One is financial, you know, they have um, significant access to capital, cheap capital that other firms don't have. And the other one is technological. So they, they benefit from the, the uh, importance of network effects and such like. And these give them market power in the sense that they can buy out competitors, they can control monopolies, uh, control their competitors, build monopolies. And it also gives them technological power in the sense that they can dominate technological areas uh, and then they can set technological standards and such like. But so for, for us, this for me and others, this means it's still, you know, it's still useful to, to understand big tech as a, a social phenomenon. And this is something I've tried to do um, again with uh, collaborators by thinking through uh, kind of schematically how we might um, uh, differentiate between them and think about different types of big tech and their, and their different implications and their different sets of operations. Uh, so what I've done here is this, you know, outline these, these, these kind of varieties of big tech um, and specifically focusing on how big tech extracts economic rents from their activities. Uh, and this is split three ways, uh, three different kinds of types of big tech. So the first one being, being a, a kind of advertising type of big tech exemplified by Google and Facebook. And the aim of these companies is to collect as much user data, personal data as possible, whether or not it's useful right now. Uh, and then their business model is based on selling access that's important, selling access to these users and this personal data to advertisers um, specifically, but also to other firms that might want to, to build up their, their, um, their business through, the, through um, uh, access to things like Facebook's social graph. Now we can see the, the impacts of this. Google, Facebook dominate online advertising. Their revenues are, I think it's 90% of Google's, nearly 90% of Google's revenue, nearly 100% of Facebook's revenues come from, uh, adverti from advertising. And together they, dominate, they um, represent nearly 60% of US online advertising uh, spending. Um, and uh, this is all about collecting data to sell access, uh, you know, to, uh, um, uh, through, uh, through the dominance of their markets, so they'll access to their, you know, the markets that they dominate. Um, so we, uh, Troy Cochran and I have uh, defined this as um, uh, um, a sort of engagement, set of engagement rents where the selling of access to users that have been segmented by this kind of uh, analysis of differential um, uh, engagement and rankings by platforms. And it's all dependent upon this kind of ability to cut people, you know, to slice people up into different kinds of uh, uh, cohorts. The second one then is this marketplace kind of uh, big tech company. Uh, so represented by, exemplified by Amazon. The aim here is to control this, this marketplace, this digital ecosystem uh, to both be a first party retailer and also a third party marketplace. 
uh, exploit the data to, you know, from your, you know, from your sales and the sales of your third minded, you create markets to dominate markets and to regulate them. Um, and this, uh, in uh, the companies like Amazon, then exploit the kind of uh, expectations of monopoly uh, in order to extract rents through the, the cheaper cost of capital for them, which enables them to leverage uh, their expansion. The final one then is this enclave uh, represented by Apple and Microsoft, and this kind of this type of uh, enclave, which is about creating and selling products and services. Um, and the aim there is to, you know, is to do, it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty normal aim that they're using data analytics to, to uh, data analytics to capture markets and to charge fees for access to the, you know, to the, um, <clears throat> to their ecosystem. Uh, so it's about trying to lock in users into this ecosystem to limit interoperability and so on. And the financial, you know, the financial power comes from there. And the building up of the, the financial assets. Uh, and it's all about trying to capture these enclave rents. So controlling the ecosystem of devices, platforms, apps, products, users, and so on, and extract monetary and data rent rents from users who use it. I know I'm running out of time here. So to finish, I was thinking about big tech and kind of how does it how does it relate to the, the kind of dominant critical framework of political economy of the last 40 years? And so I was thinking about uh, the relationship to, to neoliberalism, uh, and I've been thinking about how uh, we might understand neoliberalism in a world dominated by big tech. Uh, and the issue here is the fact is the idea that you know, neoliberalism entails this this idea that that uh, that uh, you know we've seen the installation of markets and competitions at key institutions of society, but big tech is really a tale. To, you know, it's a, it's a story about the rise of monopolies and the replacement of markets by digital platforms that are regulated by these companies. And this this has impacts on how you know how we go about defining markets, uh, how we go about designing markets, and the the um, the automation of things like supply and demand, prices, contracting, and so on. And I'm happy to discuss these in in more detail if you'd like. But I will finish there. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you, <clears throat> Keen. Um, yeah, th th there's many questions that, that we would like to ask you. Well, as, as you know, um, uh, I was a co-author of a report on uh, on big tech uh, myself. So, especially on this this uh, this data that you that you sh showed on on big tech. Uh, but before that, I, I would like to take a step back and and, and uh, perhaps start where you started uh, uh, with uh, science and technology studies. Uh, what is it? Uh, wh why do we need it to? Uh, to look at, uh, at contemporary capitalism, um, where, where, what is it made of? C could you elaborate on that? Sure. Uh, thanks for the question. Yeah. Uh, so science and technology studies, which usually gets abbreviated as STS, uh, so I might use STS uh, from now on, uh, is the is a discipline or a, a sort of interdiscipline, if you like, that uh, emerged specifically uh, to study science, technology, innovation. And so it's a, uh, a social science and humanities um, interdiscipline, uh, and it emerged in the, uh, I guess, in the mid to mid to late 20th century, 60s and 70s in particular. And it's really about trying to understand the this this social, political, economic context in which science, technology, innovation emerge, and trying to trying to understand the influence of science of um, you know the social political and the economic on science on technology and on innovation uh and it's also it's also really it's also about trying to understand the, the the kind of reverse of that what's the influence of tech you know, of uh, you know science technology on society on politics and on uh, political economy so that's now there's, there's a kind of two you know, you know a kind of acceptance of this or acknowledgement of this two-way process if you like um so uh to, to the example that i think um I mentioned in the talk around um, the, the 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 kind of startups and the 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 kind of landscape in which big tech is uh, the landscape the wider landscape that big tech is shaping and uh, and the, the the kind of emergence of startups and new firms and so on. It's I think is a good um, illustration of this this dynamic where you have firms that are developing new kinds of technologies or new kinds of um, services and products they're developing them 
uh, you know, the way where you might think they they develop them to try and find a market. Increasingly, they're being shaped to develop them to to uh, fit into the or, or what they think is fit into the uh, ambitions of big tech, so that they can be bought out and you know acquired and uh, either get a job in the big tech company through an acquire hire, as it's called, or they simply sell out and you know move on and you know they made their money and move elsewhere. Um, and I think this is this helps explain to a certain extent helps explain the uh, the growth and expansion of so-called unicorns, which are private companies valued at over a billion US dollars. Uh, and there's a huge growth in these over the last 10, 15 years as well as big tech. And so there's this, this kind of dynamic that's going on in the, in the wider uh, economic, social, political landscape. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Sarah, could you um, step in? Yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, I think... Uh, you've uh, explained the um, concept of tech scientific capitalism very clearly. So maybe I think it's uh, more useful if I ask you something about um, rentiership, which is also an important pillar of your uh, research. I'm not sure everyone is familiar with what rent is because uh, you mentioned that um, IPRs, for example, are an important uh, asset form in the uh, tech scientific capitalism that you research. Uh, and what they do is also uh, extract rent and future rent. How does that exactly work? And why is this like the, the core business model of uh, techno-scientific capitalism? Sure. Um, Sorry, so, and so IPR being intellectual property rights, of course. Yeah, so also <laughs> implicit in my question is, could you explain what IPRs are? <laughs> okay. Okay, so intellectual property right would be, it's a range of uh, legal claims uh, to... Um, essentially to forms of knowledge or creative production uh, and so they could be a patent uh, which has a certain length you know has a certain term length 20 years uh, copyright which has a, another kind of term length 70 plus years I think or author's life plus 70 years something like that and uh, trademarks would be another one um, there's also uh, um, design you know, design uh, rights things like that and there's, a, there's other interesting ones like trade secrets as well uh, which are you know which are less uh, less formalized but still uh, you know still have still are important. Um, so trade trade secrets. What are those? So it's a trade, trade secret is something where you 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 um, uh, you're restricting the use of I guess you're restricting the use of uh, the knowledge even if someone has it I guess yeah or you're trying to keep something you're you're trying to keep something secret at the same time as you're yeah you're trying to stop other people from learning about your um, development processes. So uh, the, the way of keeping, the way of, of restricting access to them is just to keep it secret in your company and to you know, force people to sign non-disclosure agreements and to you know, that sort of thing. So that you're, you're stopping the, the spread of that knowledge. That's um, the opposite of what Crash Course does. So <laughs> good to it's know. Also, yeah, yeah. It's also the opposite of patents. Patents are supposed to be, you know, a you get a monopoly, a 20-year monopoly for releasing your knowledge and sharing. And there's so there's interesting dynamics that are going on there, which would be really interesting to uh, to get Cecilia Rickap to talk about in her next um, you know, her next webinar, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, good. Um, yeah. Um so the, the so there's there's all sorts of different kinds of um of um uh, legal claims that you can make to this kind of this knowledge, to, to scientific knowledge, to forms of technology, and so on. Um, and in these, this is this is where rents come in. So, an economic rent in a an orthodox uh, in an orthodox framing, an economic rent is anything is any return that is above the the, the kind of normal market rate. Uh, so, it's a it's a very amorphous term uh, in a. Uh, a kind of more critical framing. It's been uh, related to uh, forms of monopoly. So if you, you know, any anything that um, if you extract um, returns from uh, your control uh, of um, your of a particular kind of resource or asset, then that's that's a kind of rent. It's also been related to forms of um, uh, financial returns. So. Uh, uh, excessive financial returns, um, you know. So, so something like big tech, you could we could think of the uh, potentially think of the the excessive, you know, excessive returns that investors are getting from their investment in big tech as being a form of um, a form of rent. So there's, there's there's a really long history to the debates around rent that go back to at least to Adam Smith, and there's different framings of it. There's 
um, I'm doing some work on the kind of history of it. And there's at least four different traditions uh, around trying to understand rent. And some of them are, some of them are, are lean to the, the, the kind of more uh, neoclassical, neoliberal version. So a rent is, is whatever a company can extract by lobbying government to get government to do something to regulate an area to stop competition. That would be, a, that, you know, from that perspective, that's a rent. Um, and then they, there's, there's the kind of more sort of Marxist view around monopolies uh, and the rent that can be extracted from monopolies. And then there's, there's other, other kinds of traditions as well. Um, so generally I define um, rents through this notion of rentiership, because I think it's a, it's a often rents are, um, are um, associated with a form of kind of passive extraction of value, where I think a, actually there's a lot of active strategic thinking that goes on um, that goes into the, the you know devising ways and strategies to extract value uh, and so rentiership is more active kind of notion um, and I define rentiership as the um, uh, the control and or ownership so it's not always ownership but it can just be control uh, of resources assets um, yeah, and the extraction of you know, of uh, um, value from those uh, assets as a consequence of either natural or artificial um, uh, scarcity or productivity um, and I've forgotten the third one that I use sometimes <laughs> but yeah yeah so that's that's the way I'd, I'd frame it yeah. um, <clears throat> if, I may, if I may break in there's a lot of questions, uh, a number of interesting questions. Uh, keen for just for you to know, uh, it's in the Q and A, mm -hmm. uh, you can see some of these questions. Um, we try to do it democratically, or no, we do it democratically. The ones with the most votes uh, uh, move to the top, and those are the questions we're going to ask. But okay. since there are so many questions and there's little time, uh, either Sarah and me, um, yeah, we, we we stop asking your questions and we go straight to those questions. Or we try to keep it a little bit, a bit more brief, so we we have enough time for these questions. Um, so maybe we, we ask the questions uh, briefly. I'm already talking uh, too long, of course. But then, uh, um, yeah, just we try to keep it a little bit more brief. Okay. So one question I had is uh, is of a very different nature. Is yeah, zooming out. If we look at the current age, there's there's many similarities to. Uh, the, the previous period uh, that was dominated by uh, technological change, uh, monopolies uh, around, of course, railways, uh, and then you had these immense plutocrats, the billionaire class of those of that time, people that turned economic into political power, uh, the Gilded Age. Um, do, do you think there's some sense in making those historical parallels, and, 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 and what could such a parallel learn or teach us? Yeah. Um, I think yeah, there's there's some usefulness in in, in um, uh, those parallels. Sorry, I'm just going to shut my door. Um, the uh, I think you can see the the vast accumulation of wealth uh, in the hands of a few people, and I think that this has become most evident during this pandemic with the, the, the you know the massive growth in the the valuation of these um, these big tech companies, and some of this is paper money, you know. Um, some of this is paper money. Sorry, give me a second. Yeah, maybe explain to the audience. Uh, Keen has his uh, three-year-old daughter with him, so he's been already quite generous uh, with us. And she as well. Yeah, she is. She is well. Uh, Thank you, Saga. And, and my seven-year-old daughter as well. Who wants oh. to Sorry. Yeah. Uh, apologies. Yeah. So um, yeah, we can see, we can. See, some of this is obviously paper wealth, but that paper wealth can be leveraged into you know into enormous you know market power as well as political power. Um, I think that this you know there's there's obviously some interesting uh, parallels when it comes to the you know understanding how we manage um, this uh, this power, uh, and I think there's some interesting contrast between North America and Europe and the ways that different, different countries are engaging with the, the regulation of it now. Um, and I think it's, there's, um, it's interesting to see the US now take a, uh, seemingly to take a, a, a sort of tougher stance on you know, uh, monopoly market concentration. 
Uh, and this is something that the, the EU has, has uh, been doing more. Uh, and also the EU is, is uh, currently you know, enacting or, or, or making proposals around a series of different kinds of uh, um, uh, directives and, and such like regulations that, um, uh, that are centered on, on, on trying to address this, this power. So the next few years are going to be interesting because we could see things like in the US, you could see, the, you know, the, there's an, I think it's a federal trade commission case against Facebook um, or a de the Department of Justice, one or the other that, that is potentially could lead to the break of Facebook, uh, you know, the splitting apart of Facebook and Instagram. And that'd be really interesting to see. Um, and is you know, it, the, the critique of big tech has entered, you know, the political halls of you know power as it were and they, we've had a um a, the, the u.s had a a, a 16-month investigation of big tech that wrapped up last year in october with a with a huge report 450 page report critiquing uh big tech companies uh for their practices uh, and it's a really fascinating read to kind of dig into because you get at some of the things they're doing and the the you know the problematic kind of ways that they are shaping our economies and societies yeah, that's also uh, interesting. Maybe we can um, refer to it on our website at some point. Um, so before we dive into the questions, I have one more question on, on mentorship actually again. Okay. Uh, so I understand the concept now. I also understand how uh, big tech firms in a monopolizing way try to capture certain knowledge and they decide whether it's accessible to others or not, for example. Uh, but um, I read one of your articles on uh, techno-scientific capitalism and there you end with saying that there might also be other forms of rentiership that may enable us in a positive way to, to gain perhaps more control of our lives. Uh, so yeah, we always like to end somehow on a positive note. So could you could you tell something about that? What, what kind of forms of rentiership would that be? And how do we get there? Sure. Yeah, so rent, that's one of the things about rentiership as a, as a concept is it's interesting that it, um, it you know, the usually almost, it's, it's almost universal condemnation of rents and the extraction of economic rents. Uh, but I think that you can also, you, you can think of it in a positive fashion when you think about the, you know, say social goals that you might want to, to achieve, social objectives you might want to achieve. Um, so things like, I think the example in the article you read, I think, I made the um, uh, the point that if you want to, you know, you want to support a transition to a low carbon economy, you can organize the, uh, you know, you can organize uh, the regulations, you can organize society and, um, uh, you know, the economics in certain ways that provide the sort of incentives through rents to companies to uh, change and transition towards, you know, low carbon um, outcomes. And that would be one example, um, and that would entail, you know, that could entail all sorts of all sorts of different kinds of uh, decisions and choices that are political, you know, that that, that entail forms of, uh, you know, political decision making, uh, and new kinds of policy frameworks and such like. Thanks. <clears throat> I will immediately start with the Q and A because there's so many questions, and um, well, I, I really appreciate it that uh, people are asking these questions and trying to participate. Um, so yeah, if, if, you, if you if you open up the Q&A box and you can read it yourself, that's, that may be a bit easier. But yeah. I, I would like to start with, the, with the, the question on the top that got the most uh, thumbs up from Tobias Klinge, a, a co-author of, of, of our report. Yeah. Uh, by coincidence, uh, I didn't vote for this question, but uh, so we often speak about monopoly while the firms themselves, as to be expected, of course, highlight their supposedly competitive uh, environment. How would you characterize the dynamics in this sector? So I think that, yeah, that's an interesting point. So just to, yeah, just to follow up with that, it's, it's that's, so th something like this, uh, this US investigation into, into big tech, uh, it's, it's fascinating to look at the ways that the, the company executives justify their, uh, you know, their strategies and their, their position, because they do, they, like uh, Tobias said, they, they basically say, we're in a very highly competitive market because we, we consider the market to be this. You know, if you if your Facebook, Facebook, I think literally said, we consider the market to be anything that captures your attention. 
And so therefore we're competing against everything that, that, that could possibly take your attention away from Facebook, right? So that's a reason, so there's an, in, there's an interesting uh, um, epistemic question, I guess, around how do we define what a market is and how do we go about defining the, uh, the competitiveness of the market? And that's something I want to explore in more detail by looking at that specific kind of, um, you know, set of claims around markets and, and non-markets. Um, I think that this, uh, it's a, so this is, this is a, this is a kind of, uh, um, as I say, epistemic question. It's a legal question in the current environment. A monopoly is, is you know, the, somewhere like North America, monopoly is not by definition illegal. Uh, monopolistic anti-competitive practices are illegal. But if you are, a, you know, a large company that just dominates a market, that's not illegal by itself. And so this is, this is, a, this is a kind of set of legal, uh, you know, consequences, set of legal changes that were pursued and enacted um, as, a as a consequence of the, the dominance of kind of Chicago school you, you could call it neoliberal thinking around, um, you know, what a what a market is, what monopoly is, and and so on, and it specifically focuses on the issue of, of consumer welfare, prices, consumer prices, and such like. Sarah, would you like to ask the second question? Yes, I'd love to. So there's uh, several with eight endorsements, but I was already focused on one by uh, I hope I pronounced it correctly, Emiliano Cabrera Roca. Uh, who asks what really is scientific about techno scientific capitalism? I see the techno, which is like data and infrastructure, and I see the capital. But where's the science? I think it's a nice question. Okay, with science. Well, I think this comes back to uh, this comes back to the definition of techno science. So, so you have this, um, you know, in SDS, you don't have. You, you don't have this uh, anymore, really, this distinction between science and technology in the, in the same way that you might have in uh, the kind of, you know, our, our vernacular conversations or, you know, our, our everyday conversations. Uh, and this is because, you, you you know, technologies come out of the, the kind of scientific um, uh, developments as much as, you know, scientific developments depend upon the technologies uh, that, you know, that you're able to do. So there's this two-way process. So if we think of something like, um, just to think of something like, uh, you know, something very basic, like a, um, you know, Google search, Google search involves a, a, you know, a lot of scientific sort of analysis and, you know, the, the kind of data analytics to underpin it. Uh, it's not simply a, you know, it's not simply a, uh, a, you know, a, a, a piece of technology there. It's also entails a, you know, an array of, knowledge claims and epistemic kind of uh, developments behind it so they might not be they might not be perfectly visible and up front but they're, you know they're, they're, they're there. yeah so it's but, also about the normative claims within science of that as well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i don't i don't want to uh, rush through it but uh just uh another question uh to put in um so uh, yeah um kevin Mulhern, I don't know if I pronounced the name right. Um, would Amazon not be better understood as an infrastructure rentier uh, with AWS uh, and FWA being the more uh, profitable areas of their businesses? Thinking of the work of Brett Christophers. Um, well, surprising that you didn't brought his uh, Brett Christophers up, but uh, that's, that's okay. Um, yeah, I think that it's... Possibly it could be think, thought of as, as an infrastructure rentier, uh, a form of inter in infrastructure rentiership. But I think that, um, what, um, yeah, it's an interesting. It's an interesting case. Amazon is it is is an interesting case because Amazon does so much, right? And it's it's so entangled with uh, retail, uh, with uh, as as the. The, the questioner asked uh, mentioned AWS is its web services, uh, so the provision of, of cloud, um, um, yeah, cloud cloud software and, and, and services and so on. And it's also a huge a huge advertising giant as well. So this, it's it's across everything in, in some way. So fitting it into one or the other, I think, is, is it can be tricky. Um, but I think that the the, the the way I was framing it was to think about, you know, just thinking about Amazon as being this this um, company that is aiming for, you know, monopoly, 
so its, it's aim is to to dominate and to um, uh, as a consequence of its aim to dominate it gets a a, a huge financial um, benefit from the the lower cost of capital than other firms um, and so that's why it's this kind of expected monopoly rent uh, the way it's defining it so it it it's there's some really really strange dynamics with amazon where if amazon announces that it's going to enter a market you know it's going to enter you know whatever market uh the the, the companies in that market that, that it's the existing companies in that market their value just drops so there's, there's all these kinds of weird that weird dynamics that go on that i think are as important as thinking of it as an infrastructure um so i i yeah so i i, I get the point but i think that this there's, um, there's, there's other things I think are, are, are as critical then. Yeah. Thanks. So um, I think that it would be good to at least do the, the, the question by uh, Veronica Uribe and Patrick Gallagher. So then we all know how much time more or less we have. Yeah, so I'll start with Veronica then. Uh, Veronica Uribe del Aguila. Um, how do we make sense of commons in techno-scientific capitalism for open source software or hardware? And maybe you can explain also what commons is, perhaps not everyone knows. Okay. Uh, so the idea of the commons being a, a set of resources that, um, that are accessible to, to everyone in, in, in common. Uh, so generally associated with the land. So you have common land that everyone can use to graze their animals on. And then with the, you know, the onset of capitalism, they start getting enclosed. The, so the land starts getting enclosed literally by fenced in by, by people who, who take the land uh, and turn it into private property. Um, so yeah, the commons is an interesting one because I think the, the commons is often held up as a, a, um, a sort of an alternative. Uh, to what's going on with things like big tech and the you know the enclosing of knowledge and so on, um, and I actually think that the commons is it's it's quite compatible with big tech. Uh, so the commons is you know we could think of big tech often draws on the commons in a way and then uh, uses the you know what it what it wants from the commons in order to create something else that that is then um, you know it can turn into property or can turn into some form of control. And an example of this would be personal data. So personal data, is, I find personal data very fascinating. Uh, you know, personal data, um, you know, our names, our addresses, our financial information, sometimes, you know, more sensitive data like our health data, but also just, you know, all sorts of stuff that, you know, information about us that you can collect, right? Now we don't, no one owns personal data, this kind of personal data. We can't own the facts about ourselves and such like our names and whatever. Um, so you don't have a, you don't have a property claim to it. Uh, and so it, it, it's, it, you know, anyone can collect that information and turn it into, into something else that they might want to turn it into. So a, you know, with, with Google or Facebook, they're turning it into, uh, you know, they're plugging it into their kind of inferential analytics, data analytics to, 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 to work out, you know, who to try to sell stuff to essentially. So you can, you can think of personal data as being a kind of commons that anyone can go and extract information about people from. Uh, and that's, you know, that's really helps big tech companies when it comes to, you know, some of their business models, like the advertising business model. Um, so there's a sense in which sometimes the commons doesn't always, doesn't always do the, the protective job that it could do. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a, there's a need for thinking about um, uh, the way that the commons are governed in order to do that kind of protective job. If possible, Thank you, uh, Keen. I, I would like to uh, combine two last questions. So one by uh, Patrick Gallagher. Um, have, you thought, have you thought about resistance in a Polanian sense? Is there a double movement to the rise of big tech? And uh, perhaps it can be um, combined or not with the following question by uh, Sham. And then this comes a very difficult name, uh, Bara, Barad Vai. How do, how do you view the impact uh, of the big tech, which are mostly Western US based um, on growing economies such as India, given that most of their labor force, oh, sorry, the, the question just moved, uh, labor force is based out of South Asia banking on population? Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll start with that first, first, that second question. Sorry, which I think is really an interesting question because I think a lot of a lot of the labor that goes into big tech is hidden, and so there's some um, 
interesting work uh, I can't I can't remember the, the author unfortunately and I apologize for not remembering the author's name but they, they wrote a book called ghost work uh, which is about um, the all the, the 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 people that are doing the the kind of AI training and they are you know working out of um, uh, the global south to do to train AI basically and so there's a lot of this this work going on that we just this is just not visible um, so that's a, there's, there's a there's a there's a really interesting set of connections there um, that are worth digging into and unpacking further. Um, when it comes to resistance in the Polanyian sense, there's kind of double movement. I think I think we can see some of that. You know, in taking it from a, a kind of the, the Polanyian notion, I think we can see some of that now. Uh, we can see it with the you know the the court cases in the U.S., uh, the European Union's kind of a, attempts to um, implement you know, new kinds of directives and such like other countries. Canada has started an investigation into Amazon, um, and the, you know Australia has a you know has its, um, its competition uh, and consumer um, commission. Uh, their their new kind of regulations around um, uh, you know media. Uh, and uh, uh, Facebook and uh, Google paying for media. So I think there's, there's, there's those kinds of elements to it. And I think there's also, there's also a, a kind of more, uh, a broader social movement that could be identified uh, around trying to find ways to, um, you know, protect data, to organize, to, uh, you know, outside of these kinds of um, big tech uh, ecosystems, platforms and such like. Uh, and so I think there is, there is, things are going on. I just, I don't know whether that's, how much of it will uh, will lead to change without a kind of more you know it's maybe more coordination would be coordinated resistance would be uh, um, yeah be useful yeah well thank you um, I think that now we are um, almost at the end uh, Sarah yeah could perhaps uh, mention what we're going to do in the in the following sessions but before that. Uh, I, I believe she's also here as one of the participants. Maybe uh, if you have a question uh, to uh, Cecilia Ricap, this would be a good moment uh, to pose it. Sure. So my question really is about goes back to what I mentioned during the you know during uh, earlier was about you know how do we you know how do you how do you have diff, you know what are your different takes on uh, modes of rentiership and their relationship to uh, different types of intellectual property rights? So you know. Are there differences when it comes to different forms of intellectual property rights? Great, yes. Two weeks to think about that. Okay. Uh, and now Sarah can, um, can talk us through the end. Yeah, so um, thanks a lot, Keen. Thank you for uh, brilliantly answering all those questions and also our questions. Uh, I'm very sorry to say that time flies when you're having fun <laughs> because there's still so many questions left. Uh, and actually someone suggested like, hey, there are so many good questions posed here that uh, the audience is interested in. Uh, can't we start like um, an online platform uh, to bundle those questions or where people can chat? And yeah, I think we're gonna discuss that within the Crash Course team because I think it's a good suggestion because there's so much knowledge and so many open questions yet to be answered. It would be re really interesting to connect you all. Uh, so we'll give that a thought and come back to it. So Keen, thank you so much. Um, the recording of this webinar uh, for those of you who want to watch it again or spread the message or who weren't there to witness it this first time will be put online so you can watch it at any time. And there's also a podcast version. Uh, there'll be show notes with references to articles uh, by Keen, for example. And there'll be also a summary uh, of this webinar. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank also all participants for taking part in this webinar. It was the first one in the third series of Crash Course on Big Tech, Techno Feudalism and Democracy. I think it was a very good introduction into uh, techno scientific capitalism and uh, yeah, the, the role that Big Tech plays in our lives and also the challenges it poses. So we'll talk um, a lot more about those challenges like uh, monopolies and uh, intellectual property rights also uh, during the next uh, sessions. I'd also like to thank uh, Fiona Duff for being here. I saw you there uh, in the participants list, Fiona. Uh, Fiona is the director of uh, TNI, the Transnational Institute, uh, and TNI supports Crash Course, and we'd like to thank TNI for that very much as well. Uh, so our next uh, webinar is with Cecilia Recap, who was already here, and she got her first question from Queen, Queen already. Um, she will answer that question and many more questions on the 6th of May uh, at four o'clock uh, Central European time. 
And her talk will be on intellectual property and monopoly uh, capitalism. And Cecilia is studying uh, the rising concentration of intangible assets, which Keen also discussed today, uh, focusing on power relations and the distribution of data and innovation uh, in economic gains, uh, resulting geopolitical tensions, and the effects on knowledge commons, which we also discussed, and development. So I think uh, Cecilia is uh, very eligible to take us deeper into some concepts that Keen introduced us in today. If you want to um, already uh, do a little bit of research, her new book is uh, out now, which is called Capitalism, Power and Innovation, Intellectual Monopoly, Cat Capitalism Uncovered. So uh, I think that's good uh, reading material and food for thought for the next time. Um, so last but not least, let me uh, take you to the Crash Course uh, website, just sharing my screen, um, because then I can also show you uh, the next episodes, which are already on our platform. So this is the first one. Uh, we've been through it today. The next one is scheduled here. You can click on it and then you can sign up. The third one will be on uh, platforms and the limits of competition policy with Farva CEO. Number four. Uh, on Big Tech and the Global South with Nandini Chami uh, on the 3rd of June. And uh, the 5th will be uh, Big Tech versus uh, the Public with Francesca Bria on the 17th of June. So the sixth one is still to be announced. It's going to be a bonus episode. We're planning on it and we will hope it will take place because it will be awesome. Um, then here is uh, the report uh, that and I and Rodrigo mentioned. It is by uh, Rodrigo and um, also some other people who were uh, on uh, the show today uh, in the chat. And uh, the TNI website, TNI being a supporter of Crash Course. Um, and I think that's it for today. Uh, I'd like to thank you all again. Thank you so much, Keen. Thank you, participants. Thank you, Rodrigo, for co-hosting. Thank you, uh, Crash Course team, for helping so much uh, behind the scenes. And uh, we're hoping to see you all in two weeks' time. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.